If you're following along in your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Again, that's 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they, not wanting to endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That passage that was just read for us, I often describe as the preacher's job description. Now that's not just the pulpit preacher, that's anyone who is charged to preach the word, and that of course is every single Christian. Uh, But we are to go and share that good news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. But when Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be ready, or be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, he was telling him to adhere to the pattern that had been shared to Paul as well. And that word pattern is a very interesting word. Uh, We might use it in a lot of more contemporary ways today, but I do think about my mom having a pattern with her sewing. Mom growing up did a lot of sewing around the house, not just fixing all of the clothing that I abused as I was growing up, but she would help other people by him in a pair of pants or him in a dress or, or in many cases, uh, creating an entire outfit all on her own. And I can remember she would have a pattern. That would be some paper material that would represent the size and the shape of the outfit she would be preparing or working on. And she would lay that on top of the material. And she would take pins and she would pin it together so that it would be just perfect. And then she'd cut along the lines, cut along the edge of that pattern so that she would have the right size and shape for the shirt or pair of pants or dress that she was ultimately going to make. Paul had been given a pattern by God. And he then turns to Timothy and says, I want you to continue preaching along the lines of that very same pattern. This is something that we see in the Old Testament, for instance, when it comes to the tabernacle and how it was to be built and how it was to be designed and how it was to be put together. God was very, very clear in Exodus 25 and verse 9, according to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. Same book, same chapter, just a few verses down the line in verse 40. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. Uh, Patterns are very important to God. Not only should we walk in the pattern he has given to us, but we should set that example for others. And when we think about the Bible... The very word of God that we are to preach and teach and to learn and live in our lives. We think about a pattern that we are all to adhere to, that we are all to conform to. I think about when Paul talked about uh, confirmation, uh, conforming in the book of Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. There are some patterns we want to stay away from, but there are some patterns we want to duplicate. And that's why so many times when we are visiting, when I personally get the chance to visit other congregations in other locations, it's so encouraging to me to run across a group of people that I have never met before in my life. I've never maybe seen them, set laid eyes on them before, but I come into a worship assembly and interestingly enough, they're preaching and teaching the same Bible that I preach and teach out of. 
I see them praying to the same Father through the same Son with the help of the same Spirit as I pray to. I love it on Sunday mornings we come together and we partake of the Lord's Supper. Not just some Sunday mornings or random Sunday mornings. We do so every Sunday morning as the pattern indicates for us in Scripture. They give of their means every morning and they sing songs of praise to God every morning. That's why when we went down to South America a few weeks ago and I went to Inverness and they were leading singing there. They were leading singing according to spirit and truth. Uh, when we went on to New Amsterdam, the gentlemen who would lead singing there were also le leading singing in spirit and truth. When we went down to Kakwani, the various gentlemen who would lead singing there would do so in spirit and truth. They were singing songs of praise. They were singing with their voice voices, not with the addition of any instrument, but just exactly like they were doing it in the New Testament. They were singing praises to God like they did in the first century and for centuries after that without anything else except for the song that they sang with their lips and the melody that they made in their hearts. It was very encouraging to see that. But then something else happened. And I actually told some of the preachers, I said, I'm trying to figure out how to turn this into a sermon. Because of the three locations we went to, we ran into something in every single location that was common, but that caused a tiny little bit of a problem. Now, when I say a problem, not a doctrinal problem, not a spiritual problem, but it did cause Sherry and me a little bit of a problem. Because you see... The songs that we sing out of the songbook, like you have in front of you, those songs have certain things in common. They have the words in them so that we can know what the words are. They have the, the, the notes in them so that we can know what the tune is. They have the time in them and, and other instructions that tell us how quickly or how slowly to sing that song. And what's interesting is, the people who wrote those songs wrote them to be sung in a certain way. Now, the writers of music, the writers of songs are not inspired writers. They're not God. And that's why we can take songs and we can change them up and things like that. But it's interesting. Here in the United States, we probably have a lot of people in various congregations who have a lot of understanding of music. They can read music. Now, I don't know if we have a majority of people in this congregation who can read music, but where I was raised, we had a lot of people who knew the songs. They knew how fast you ought to sing them. They knew the tune uh, that you ought to sing them. Uh, they certainly knew the words and the order in which you were to sing it. But what we found in every single congregation down there was a variance of those things. For the most part, unless they were singing a song that was maybe not in the book or from memory, the words were the same. But then, every once in a while, a note that was supposed to be held for that long ended up being held for that long right in the middle of the song. And so Sherry and I were going to continue on until we figured out nobody else was continuing on with us. So we needed to hold that note a little bit longer. Sometimes the notes were invented. <laughs> so if I can give you an idea of what I'm talking about without being in any way improper, all of us know the song Happy Birthday. If somebody comes along and goes, Happy Birthday to you. Well, we understand that. We understand the time, the tempo. We understand the notes. We got it all. But if somebody came along and went, happy birthday to you, that would throw us off. <laughs> if somebody said, happy birthday to you, that would throw us off. And every once in a while, when we were singing these songs of praise, Sherry and I got thrown off. Because some way, somehow, they strayed from the intention of the music. I want you to think about the song Amazing Grace. 
Amazing Grace is a song that most all of us know, but even it has structure to it. Even it has a certain way that it is to be sung, at least as far as how it was written. And for the most part, I think people stick to that. I think most people sing Amazing Grace the way the author intended it to be sung so many years and years ago. And yet, I've heard different tunes. I've heard different melodies to this song. There's a song by the Eagles called Peaceful Easy Feeling. And I've heard that same melody adapted to this old song. It doesn't make singing the song wrong because, again, it's not an inspired work of God. But in order for everyone to be able to sing together, we've got to have some kind of pattern to follow. And so a lot of times we have songbooks or here on Sunday mornings we have the PowerPoint behind us that, that shows all of the things about the song to keep us in sync so that no one ends up singing a solo and goes off on their own singing in a different way. And so I use this illustration to try to make a point. A point not so much about singing, but I want us to talk a little bit about the Word of God. That thing we're supposed to preach. That thing about which we are to be in absolute sync with each other. Because it is the ultimate pattern for our lives. And if we are going to make sure that we are following the Bible as God intends us, then we have to make sure that we not only study it, but we apply it as the author intended. And so that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. We're going to take a look at three points that are going to help us to understand that just a little bit better. To make sure that we are following the pattern. To make sure that we are together in this area. And by the way, although I did a lot of the preaching in that gospel, those three gospel meetings down in Guyana... It doesn't mean that the things that I heard from others was not in sync. We've got some good, faithful brethren down there who simply want to learn and want to understand the pattern for their lives even better. So this morning, let's take a look at as the author intended when it comes not to singing in songbooks so much, but to the Bible, the written word of God. Let's take a look at three ways to honor God's intentions for the Bible this morning. Three ways to honor God's intention for the Bible this morning. First and foremost, we need to always, as God's people, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to always respect His words. Now please make sure you understand what I've written there. I did not say respect His word. I said respect His word words. Now, you'll notice that in parentheses I have a word, words. It seems so far a little redundant. When I get to the second point, it'll make it a lot easier for you to see what I'm doing. But that first word there is I'm applying it from a musical standpoint. In other words, whether we're singing happy birthday outside of a worship setting or whether we are singing praise to God by singing amazing grace, if we are going to sing together these psalms, these hymns, these spiritual songs, if we are going to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord, teaching one another and admonishing one another, we need to kind of be on the same page with the wording. If everybody in here just started singing whatever words they wanted to sing, it would be chaos. And so we need to be together in sync when it comes to the words. And that then applies to what is in parentheses there. This is the very words of God. What I'm saying here is we need to respect not the word in general. Obviously, we need to do that. I'm talking about the tiny little words themselves. Every single word of every single verse, of every single chapter, of every single book, we need to respect them. The reason that I put John chapter 1 and verse 1 up there is because there is a religious group known as the Jehovah's Witnesses who do not respect the words of God. 
The reason I know that is because John 1 and verse 1, if you turn there in your Bibles right now, I don't care whether you have the King James, the New King James, the Old American Standard, the New American Standard, the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, the NIV, it really doesn't matter. John chapter 1 and verse 1, very uniquely amongst the various translation, is almost always translated word for word identically the same. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But this particular religious group that I referenced, they did not have respect for that. They did not have respect for that last thing because their doctrine taught something contrary to the Bible. Their doctrine teaches that Jesus is not God, as John 1 and verse 1 clearly states, and He was God. No, they believe He was a created being, much like we are. And He is more powerful than we are, but He's not the Father. He's a lesser being. So they rewrote some of the words. And in John 1 and verse 1, in their particular translation... It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was not a capital G God, but was a little g God, a created being, a lesser being, but certainly not omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence itself, not the ultimate eternal Jehovah God. Well, you see, that's lack of respect for the words of the Bible. When we go to the Bible and we read something and it says, okay, Kevin, you need to change your life here and say, well, I'm willing to change my life in this verse because I like those words and I'll change my life over here according to this verse because I like those words. But I don't really like this change. This is asking a little much of me. It's asking things that I'm not comfortable doing. When we have that attitude, we're not respecting the words of God. And if we are going to be one with God, then we have to be one regarding the words of God and our attitude toward those words. It's interesting, whether you look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 or Revelation chapter 22 verses 18 and 19, you have a similar principle, maybe an identical principle. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2 says, Do not add to or take away from the Word of God. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, specifically in reference to the book of Revelation, but it says the same thing. Do not add to or take away from the words of God. The idea is that you respect what's there. Don't add your own words to it. God doesn't need your help. Don't take away from the words of the book. That's going to cost you potentially eternal consequences. Simply accept the Word of God. Simply accept the words of God as they're given. As Paul would tell Timothy just a little earlier than our scripture reading earlier. All scripture is inspired by God. That means every single passage, including every single word in that passage, is there for a reason. We may not always understand those reasons, but they're there for particular reasons. It's our job to study to understand those reasons so that we can be better servants of the Almighty God. If we are going to honor God's intentions for His Bible, then we're going to have to respect the very words of those Bibles. So just like when we sing so that we can sing together, when we study, when we learn, when we live according to God's will for us, then we can do that together as well. Number two, we need to respect his notes. Now maybe you're starting to see where I'm going with this a little bit. The note is the reference to the music, the, the melody of a particular song. And just like I can't expect you to sing... Happy birthday with me if I'm just going to change the melody and expect you to keep up with me. We can't do that with God's Word as well. Now, what do we mean? Well, I'm talking about His arrangement. We sometimes talk about a song and, and the musical arrangement based on how the, the author of that song put the tune together. 
Well, we need to do that in regard to God's Word as well. We need to respect how it's arranged and how what is taught in it is arranged. Just for time's sake, I have only included a few of these things. But I want you to consider something. The Old Testament comes before the New Testament for a reason. If you read the New Testament and then go back to the Old Testament, you will be enlightened, but you may not understand it quite as well as if you understand what came first followed by what came second. And it's very interesting. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, the Apostle Paul said to the churches of Galatia, he said, but before faith came, and he's talking about Christ and the new covenant. Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, which is a reference to the law of Moses, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In other words, why did you go to first grade before you went to second grade? Probably because that's important. Why would you go to junior high before you went to high school? Or why would you go to college before you went to medical school or law school or some other form of advanced uh, education? There's a reason because all things need to be done decently and in order. It's very important for us to learn the basics before we learn the advanced. And what's interesting is the Old Testament served a purpose for a time and it was to bring us more successfully to the time of Christ. I know Betty Parker and I talk about the visual aspects of the Old Testament, whereas today we don't have all of those visual aspects. For instance, the altar in the Old Testament. They had a physical altar with a physical animal that was physically killed and had physical blood flowing down on the various sides of the altar. Today, we are to be that living sacrifice. Not on a physical altar, not with a physical death and physical blood flowing down, but it is the sacrificial way that we live our lives. And, and that's something that's needed. You think about little kids. They sometimes need one apple and one apple to understand that one plus one is two. But later on, you understand addition and subtraction and you figure out those multiplication tables fairly well and division and things like that. And you do so because one thing builds on another. Well, that's the case with the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament came first because that was God's design. And he understood that was what we needed. We needed that visual imagery before we could understand the greater mental imagery of the law of Christ and Christianity. If you consider Mark 16 and verse 16, why is it that belief comes before baptism? Because you have to believe before you can know what to do as a result of that faith. Uh, Acts 2 and verse 38. Why does repentance take place before baptism? Because you have to turn away from a life of sin before you can have those sins washed away. Why does Acts chapter 8 verses 36 through 39 have the Ethiopian eunuch on the verge of baptism and clearly he is heard and believed and repented but... He's like, what's keeping me? He's, Here is water. What's preventing me from being baptized? Is there anything missing? Is there anything left? I'm following this process. You have taught to me Jesus, and now I'm obeying Jesus. Is there anything that prevents me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he and Philip went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Why? Because first things first. There is an order to things. And I want you to consider singing for just a second. I want you to consider if we all decided to sing a song. Maybe we all have the same words, but we all decide to sing the song with our own tune. Maybe I pass out a typed sheet of lyrics but I don't give you any music whatsoever. And I say, okay, we're all about to sing this. One, two, three, sing. What's that going to sound like? What's that going to sound like? Would it not sound like 
What the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, people would think we are barbarians or crazy. They would certainly see and hear the chaos that we are creating, not the order that God desires. But if you've ever heard big auditorium full of a cappella singing, nothing else, just the blending of the beauty of human voices giving praise to God. It's hard not to be moved, emotionally moved, much less spiritually moved at the sound you hear. Because that's everybody coming together under the same arrangement. Think about God's people. Think about the church. Think about what happens and how beautiful it is when we're all on the same page, when we're all with the Bible singing the same notes. The arrangement becomes beautiful because it's the arrangement God intended. And that's how we need to live our lives. We need to live our lives according to how God arranged things. Whether we're talking about the Bible as a whole and the Old and New Testament or whether we're talking about the plan of salvation or how we are to live our lives for Christ, we need to arrange our lives and our understanding of God's Word together. Let's take a look at the third way to honor God's intention for the Bible. That's going to be respect for his tempo. Now, some people have no clue that some songs are supposed to be sung more quickly than others or more slowly than others. But the information that's given you on the song itself actually tells us that there is a certain time to keep. Some songs are very quick, okay? Um, some songs are very slow. One of my favorite songs is a song that is designed to elicit an emotional response because of the tempo of the song. That's the song, Low in the Grave He Lay. Love that song. Because when you sing the lyrics of the stanzas, You'll sing songs like, low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. It's a sad part of the song. It's demonstrating how Christ died for us. It's demonstrating the pain and the agony he went through for us. But then all of a sudden you get to the chorus of the song. And it literally says right there, faster, speed it up, pick up the pace. Why? Because up from the grave he arose. Up from the grave. It's an exciting time of the song because Jesus overcomes death. And in the same way that in one moment we may be saddened because of why he died, and that's for us and our sins, and what he had to endure on that cross and be put into that grave for our mistakes, suddenly we get to be excited. Because in the same way he arose from the dead, he now gives us the opportunity to rise from the death of our sins as well. That song is, is supposed to be sung with a certain speed and a certain variance to that speed as the author intended. Well, when we take a look at the Bible... We see things in the Bible that help us to understand that God has a time for us as well. Go back in your Old Testament to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you've been to a funeral in recent times, a lot of times this particular passage of Scripture is read. It's read because of one particular line in here about life and death, but it's not all about that. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 reads, There's an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. 
a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. There is a time appointed for everything to occur. Now, when it comes to God's Word, there is time there as well. There are things that should happen at certain times and in certain ways, according to certain schedules even. i give you an example. I referenced it earlier, but turn in the New Testament to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. What do we read in this passage of Scripture? We read about first century Christians coming together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we read, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them. That breaking of bread is a reference to the Lord's Supper. They were coming together on the first day of the week. Somebody says, well, which week? Yes. What do you mean, which week? The first day of the week. Some translations read, first day of every week. The idea is that on Sundays, the Lord's Day, we come together as a group of people. Some people say, well, I don't really have to come together. I don't have to do that to please God. Yes, you do. Unless you are sick or prevented from being here, this is something that all children of God should do on the first day of the week. It is the time that God has set aside for us to partake of the bread, the unleavened bread, which represents the body of Jesus sacrificed on the cross, the fruit of the vine, which is the grape juice, which represents the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. It is a time that we are to do this in remembrance of him. Now, it doesn't mean that we forget about Jesus the other six days of the week. No, not at all. We don't forget about his sacrifice. No, not at all. But when is it that we are to come together? Not on Monday. Not on Tuesday. Not on Saturday. I know of congregations that I read about years ago out west that decided that they would have uh, the communion served on Saturday evenings because they didn't want to interrupt everybody's sleep on Sunday morning. There's a time for us to get up. There's a time for us to come together. And that's on the Lord's day to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We are not authorized any other time to do that particular act of worship. Those other times are not as the author intended. I even think about 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Take a look there, if you will, for just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Once again, we return to Paul talking to Timothy. And he's talking in this particular case, he's given a whole length of descriptions, characteristics of an elder in the church, an elder or an overseer or a shepherd of the flock. For those of you who have questions about that, that's not the guy standing in front of the pulpit just because he's standing behind the pulpit. What I'm doing right now is I am preaching. So if you need to describe me in some way, I am a preacher. But this congregation has three elders, three overseers, three shepherds of this flock. There always has to be two or more. There is no such thing in Scripture as one pastor, which means shepherd. Uh, That's a designation for those who oversee the flock. Well, one of the things that we know about an elder is by the very meaning of the word itself. He's an older man. So in other words, from a time standpoint, this person has to be older, has to be more experienced, has to be more mature in order to serve in this capacity. And just because he's older in age and experience and even maturity doesn't mean he's qualified. First Timothy 3 and verse 6 reads for us that he's not to be a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. In the same way that a young person has to go through those younger years and adolescence before they grow into maturity, we have to have that expectation of those who serve as shepherds, that they themselves are not new to the faith, that they themselves are not new creations in Christ, but that they have been Christians long enough to understand more of what that means and to understand the organization of the church and to understand how to lead God's people forward in the ways that are right, according to the pattern of the Bible. 
So you can see that there is time that is involved. We need to respect God and his intentions for the Bible through paying attention to his words or his words. Paying attention to his notes or how he has arranged things so that we can follow them in unison. And his tempo or his time, what he wants according to his time and when he wants those things designated. You know, it's interesting. If you go back to another set of instructions that were great and detailed, you'll find the story of Noah. You'll find the story of how Noah built an ark, a big giant boat for God. And God gave him all kinds of instructions. He told him how many floors it was to have, told him how many doors it was to have, how many windows it was to have, uh, how many animals would be collected on it, even how, what kind of wood the ark was to be made out of. He was told how long it was to be and how wide it was to be and how tall it was to be. And Genesis 6.22 reads, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. <laughs> Did he follow the words of God? Evidently to the letter. Did he follow the arrangement of God in regard to uh, how this boat was to be fashioned? You know, we don't read anything about, you know, multiple windows. That's something we see in children's art today. All of the animals sticking their heads out of all these different windows. No, that wasn't a part of the arrangement of the ark. Noah did all that God told him to arrange. And he did it in the time God gave him. The Bible says that God decided he was going to destroy the world because of its wickedness in 120 years. The Bible does not say that it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. But we do know that within that time frame, he was given the detailed instructions on how to put that boat together because it had to be done by the time time ran out. Because when time ran out and God sent the rain, Noah, his wife, their three sons and their three wives, eight in all, along with all of those animals, were inside this fully built boat with the window closed and the door closed, ready to be saved by God from the flood that would destroy everything else. It's a good example of someone who followed the pattern God set out for him to accomplish. That's the challenge for us today, is to follow the pattern that God has set out for us. And if it helps you to think about it in a song format, okay, that's fine. Then pay attention to the words, pay attention to the tune, and pay attention to the tempo of the Bible. But if you need to understand it a different way, because Kevin, you're just confusing. Well, that's okay. Pay attention to the words that God has put before you, knowing that he knows everything and we don't. Therefore, what he says is accurate and correct according to his perfect will. Make sure you follow the arrangement, whether we're talking about the arrangement of the plan of salvation or the arrangement of how we worship when we come together on a Sunday morning like this, or how we live for him in this life, arrange your life according to the pattern of the word. And then make sure you do it according to his time. Don't get the cart before the horse. Make sure that you do it according to the time that is necessary. One of the wonderful things about Christians, specifically new converts, is their fire, their excitement to do things for the Lord. But sometimes that's the very problem with new Christians. They are so excited that they don't realize they cannot do everything on day one. They don't know everything on day one. They don't understand everything on day one. It's going to take time. But that's what we do. We daily study. We daily commit ourselves to the Word of God so that we can all be on the same page, not only together, but most importantly with God in heaven above. This morning, let me ask you, are you following the pattern?
Are you following the pattern that God has laid out for us to follow? If not, I want to encourage you to do that. If you will follow that pattern, you will find out what you have to do, which is what millions of people over the last 20 centuries have figured out what they needed to do in order to be saved. To study that word, to determine what to believe, based upon that belief, to repent of sins and confess the name of Christ, to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Do you understand there is no other way to be saved but by the pattern that God has established for us? Instead of listening to the people on TV or the radio who are teaching something false, how about we make the decision today that we're going to make sure and follow the pattern of God? We're going to do the things that He intended for us to do so that we can be saved. And if you are a child of God, the easy part is over. Being washed in the blood of the Lamb, that's something that doesn't necessarily take someone that long to accomplish, but living the rest of your lives as Christians, according to the pattern of Christ, according to His example, doing things His way, saying things His way. If we do that, that's going to take us the rest of our lives. But if we can be faithful unto death, we'll have a crown of life, and that's what we encourage you to do. That's what the Lord encourages you to do this morning. And if we can help you, we're always ready to do that. Just let us know how we can. But let us all resolve today to be one with all of these other congregations around the world who are one with us as we strive to be one by God by following the pattern and the pattern only as the author Intended. While together we stand and sing. I'm satisfied.